All right, so now, kids, you guys are dismissed. Does any of that sound familiar to anybody? Maybe a little bit for some. So there's youth group today. There's elementary uh, today. Moms, of course, if you want to keep your kids with you, you're welcome to. Otherwise, send them that direction. So, um, hey, I know Mother's Day, uh, you know, it's, of course, this day of celebration. But I do realize, of course, that it comes... You know, it's also for many people, it's a day of mixed emotions. And, you know, maybe, you know, there's the joy of motherhood, maybe the loss of a mother that you uh, feel particularly today. Um, there's that struggle for those who are still waiting and wanting to have children. Um, you know, for some people, there's regrets over their own sort of motherhood experience or their experience with their mother. And, and I realize that for a lot of people, uh, the burden is so great that it's actually become a day when a lot of women will just stay home from church. Um, and we certainly don't want that to be the case. We want to honor all of the moms that are here. We want to honor all of the women that God has placed into our lives. You know, there are those certainly who, you know, are moms who work in the home. There are those who are moms to us in different ways. You know, moms who are us, you know, spiritual moms or, or just women who are motherly encouragers to us all. And so we want to honor all of you today and just say thanks to the Lord for your uh, role in our life. So with that said, I think they are you sort of as you uh, as you take off today. But with that said, we're going to continue uh, right through rather than a sort of a Mother's Day message. We're just going to continue right on through the book of Revelation. We're going to be this morning in Revelation chapter five. So you can open there. Um, if you don't know, it's toward the back of the book. It's sort of near the end. So let's pray. And we're going to jump right into our text Today, So, Father, we do thank you for today, and we thank you for all of the wonderful women in our lives that you've placed there to encourage us, Lord, to kind of keep us in line and to, um, to bring us along, Lord, in the things of you. And so we pray that you would bless them today, Lord. We pray as well that you would bless our time in your word, that you would be our teacher this morning, Lord. We pray for that ministry of your spirit to be manifest here today, and we pray that you give us understanding of those things that... Um, that you have for us this morning. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if we were to compare the book of Revelation kind of to a play, we would say that those first few chapters, the stage had been set, right? We looked at chapter one, the things which relation of the glorified Christ. And then chapters two and three were the things that are, right? We looked at the whole scope of church history as we looked at the Lord's people and the things that Jesus had specifically to say to those seven churches. And then last time in chapter four, we looked and we saw kind of as the curtain rises, if you will, and we get a glimpse, kind of a view of this initial setting, and we just marveled over the description that John gave us of the throne room of God. And you remember that John saw the Lord there seated on his throne and, and sitting there in majesty and in authority. And we saw the elders around the throne, representative of all believers all throughout history. We saw those creatures, remember those fantastic four living creatures amidst the throne, which we said were representative of all of the creation. And then finally, as we finished up last week in chapter four, we saw the worship of him on the throne as we saw, first of all, creation, and then we saw all of redeemed mankind praising God together. And then this morning, as we continue right on further in this sort of final section of the book, this three-part outline given to us by the Lord, we're looking at the things which will take place after this. And now here in chapter five, the stage has been set Right, The curtain has risen, and this morning we're going to see that the action begins. We're going to see really that this drama of God's final program for the universe starts to unfold in our text today. And so we join in with John, remember, been caught up into heaven and sort of basking in the light there of God's glory. You remember it radiated out from him so beautifully that all John could describe, remember, were these fantastic colors that he saw. And now I think kind of as he adjusts to the sight and right, adjusts to all that light 
of that heavenly scene, John now tells us that he sees, first of all, that God is holding on to something in his hand. And in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 5, John writes that I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So the focus of chapter 4 was the throne, right? The one seated on the throne. And here John now kind of shifts his focus to this some sort of a scroll that was held in the right hand of God himself. And so what John saw there in this scroll, that's pretty common, and yet it was strangely unique. And of course, all writing in those days was done on scrolls. And they were usually these kind of 8 inch by 10 inch kind of pieces of papyrus that were then sewn together horizontally and ultimately wrapped around these wooden handles. And different documents would be kind of different lengths of the scroll depending on how much writing was on them. And then they would be sealed with these wax seals just to ensure their integrity, if you will. And so the question, of course, which the church has been asking for 2,000 years, is what was this sealed scroll specifically? This scroll with these seven wax seals. Because really, the scripture doesn't specifically say what the scroll is. And yet we believe that this scroll is nothing less than the title deed to the planet Earth. And there's a very interesting event in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 32 that also involves a very similar kind of a sealed scroll. And so this helps to further our understanding of what this is. Remember, when we go through the book of Revelation, we're always looking to the Old Testament to help us interpret the different figures and the images that we see here. And as we come to Jeremiah chapter 32, you guys know Jeremiah is in the city of Jerusalem and the city is in the middle of what would be turn into a two-year siege by the Babylonians. The city is about to fall to the Babylonians. Jerusalem is about to be taken. And what we see is that in the midst of this siege, God tells Jeremiah that his cousin Hanamiel is going to come to him offering to sell Jeremiah this field that he had just outside of the city and that he needed to sell. So in order to keep this field in the family, he wanted to know if Jeremiah would be willing to buy it because Jeremiah was his nearest kinsman, right? His nearest blood relative. And of course, the problem was that this land that he was trying to have Jeremiah buy was about to become totally worthless. When Babylon finally took the city, in fact, All of that land around the city at this point, including this field, had already been gobbled up by the Babylonians. Remember, Israel is about to go into captivity for 70 years. And at this point, they have no knowledge except what God had already revealed to them through his prophetic promises through the prophets just like Jeremiah, but they had no knowledge that they ever were truly going to come back into this land that they would ever have a chance again to own their own homes in this land where they had lived. So this is a terrible real estate deal that God is presenting to Jeremiah. And yet God very clearly says, buy the land. He says, when your cousin comes to you, you go ahead and you buy that land from him and do it as a witness to the fact that you're not always going to be in captivity in Babylon, that one day you will come back to this land just as those very things that you have been prophesying in my name. He says, I want you to practice, Jeremiah, what you've been preaching. He says, buy the land, take the scroll, take the title deed to that land, put it in an earthen vessel so that when you come back or your family comes back, that land will be there waiting for you. And so in the account, we see Jeremiah pays his cousin the 17 shekels of silver. They sign the deed. They roll it up into a scroll. They seal it with these wax seals. And then it was given to Jeremiah, and he put it away in a dry, safe place for storage until 
those promises of God were finally fulfilled and that land could be claimed. So it's a beautiful scriptural picture of precisely, I think, what we see happening here. And yet John gives us this additional, very specific detail in this verse that I think helps us confirm that this sealed scroll is a sort of a title deed because on a scroll that was made of papyrus, the front side would have been smooth, but the back side would have been rough. So ordinarily, writing was only done on the one side, and yet here, John points out that there was writing on both sides. He says it was writing on the inside and on, which was interesting to him and is very significant for us because Jewish history does show us there was one particular kind of a document in one very specific situation where there was writing that would have appeared on both sides. And it was when you had the title deed to a piece of property which had fallen into default. So the original deed would have been written on the inside, rolled up and sealed with one seal, but in the event that the owner defaulted, went into debt and was unable to pay, he would have to relinquish that title deed. And then in that case, on the back side would be written all of his debts and the purchase price that was required in order to buy back the property. And then they would roll it back up and put seven seals placed upon the scroll. And if during that next seven years, if the man could pay off his debts, then the seals would be broken and the title deed would be returned to his owner. But after seven years, he would lose out on his opportunity to redeem that property. So in essence, theologically, the title deed to this planet, if you will, was given to who? It was given to Adam. You remember in Genesis chapter 1, God told Adam and Eve what? He said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion, he says, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So man was originally given dominion over this entire planet, and yet we know that through their sin, Adam and Eve forfeited their right to ownership of the earth. When they chose to disobey God, right, and to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and of evil, and through their disobedience, they gave up what God had given to them. And effectively, it was Adam's sin then that kind of transferred to Satan the title deed of this planet. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that our planet presently he says, is under the bondage of corruption. And it's because of this that Paul refers to Satan, to the Corinthians, he calls him the God of this age. Jesus refers to Satan in John chapter 12 as the ruler of this world. And so when Adam and Eve passed that dominion on to the devil, they gave Satan a place in human history. They gave him a dominion and authority in human history that God never ever intended that the devil would have. They forfeited their own dominion over to the devil. So when we see and we ask, you know, why is there disease and why are there disasters and why do people die? Why is there suffering and sorrow and trial and tragedy? It's because mankind has forfeited God's good and perfect creation and it's now under the control of Satan. And so now the whole history of the human race is now the story of God providing for man to be able to recapture what it is that we lost because of that sin. It's the, the story of the whole human race, if you will, kind of waiting for the creation to be redeemed. And I think that there's an application here for our own lives because we so often forget that our lives work in the same way. So often we're the ones that sort of ourselves the consequences of our own disobedience, right? All of our failures and our mistakes, right? They are filling up the backside of that scroll. Some of us maybe more than others. 
But as God often allows these very things to kind of come to bear in our lives, it's not because he's acting vindictively, he's simply acting justly. And yet what the Bible teaches is that God's plan for our lives will always include these wonderful opportunities for his mercies to prevail. And that's just precisely what we see in his plan here for the planet. His plan for the planet and for all of mankind provides this beautiful opportunity for redemption because John tells us next in verse two, he says, then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. So all of a sudden the focus changes kind of suddenly from the content of the scroll to these seals that are on the scroll, keeping it closed, right? And to anyone who was worthy to take it and to break those seals open. In other words, is there anyone who's, who is able to meet the requirements to pay off the debt and to redeem this world back from the bondage of sin. And notice that this unnamed angel, notice he's not asking who's willing to do it. He's asking who's worthy to do it. And this is a very important distinction because there's lots of people who are willing to take power, right, and to take authority, even, you know, to jump in and to help out when there's a need, but it's much more difficult to find people who are qualified and who are equipped and who are able, and in this case, who are worthy. So here's this angel, right, this mighty angel, a strong angel, and he shouts this announcement, anyone who's worthy to open the scroll, to step forward, but as we see in verse three, it says, and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. No one was worthy. Now, here's a pro tip. Pro tip for you to use when we get up to heaven and when we are witnessing this very scene before our eyes. When the angel asks if anyone is worthy, do not raise your hand. I promise you, this is not your moment, right? Now, we don't know. The scriptures don't tell us just how long this, I'm sure, very painful pause occurs in heaven. We don't know how long the angel waited to see if anyone could step forward, but no one could step forward. No one could take the scroll out of the Father's hand. No one could then take the earth back into the complete control of the Lord. And so, understandably, John tells us in verse 4, he says, So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. I don't think John could have said this in any stronger way. It's as though this strong angel looked through the entire universe to find someone worthy and hadn't found anyone worthy even to look at the scroll. And I believe that John weeps because he understands exactly what that scroll is. And so he is understandably afraid that the world is about to remain in Satan's grip forever, that this dominion and the influence that the devil now has is going to go on uninterrupted forever and ever and ever. John, of course, yearned to see the creation set free from bondage. He wanted to see God's original plan realized for the planet. And yet no saint in glory, no person on earth, no soul even in the underworld of death could take that scroll. And so John wept in despair. It's just like Paul tells us in, in Romans 8 again, that the whole creation is groaning and laboring with these birth pangs. The thought of this was so heartbreaking to him that he begins to weep, literally just this flow of tears. And why wouldn't John weep? Remember, John at this point hadn't yet read the book of Revelation, right? Because the book of Revelation was just being revealed to him at this moment. If we didn't have this book, 
If we didn't know exactly how the story ends, I would think we would definitely be weeping also at this point, right along with John. But it says in verse 5 that one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So here this elder comforts John, right? Just in the same way that we should be comforting others by pointing him to this great figure of Old Testament prophecy, right? The Messiah of Israel and of the Gentiles. He points him to the person of Jesus Christ, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah, right? One of the oldest messianic prophecies that was given way back in Genesis chapter 49, the root of David, right? Which speaks of the, the deity of Christ, proclaiming that not only would this Messiah come from the line of David, but he was the very root of that line of David. And the scriptures say, not only is he the lion of the tribe of Judah, not only is he the root of David, but specific to this, he is also our kinsman redeemer. Now, to fully understand this scene, I think we do need to understand a little bit more about the Hebrew system of owning land. And we need to be reminded about one other familiar Old Testament text, the book of Ruth, which of course, we just read through this week in our one-year Bible. Remember, if a man became poor and defaulted on his loan and had to sell his land, even sometimes sell himself, it could still be redeemed by him within that seven-year period. But if during that time the man was still unable to meet the requirements, there was yet one other way. That land and the man could be redeemed by a kinsman. And the whole story of the book of Ruth is based on this law. In Leviticus 25, it said that if one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if, if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. The redeemer we know had to be a near relative, a relative who was both willing and able to purchase back that property and then to set his kinsmen free. And of course, Jesus Christ, he is worthy to open the scroll. He's able, he is willing. And as our kinsman, as this sinless one, he has fulfilled all of the righteous requirements of God. The verse tells us right here, he has prevailed, right? He has overcome, he's conquered, he has won the victory, and God has accepted his sacrifice of atonement. So that, as the writer to the Hebrews says, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. And then he says this interesting thing, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. Now this is important because what it tells us is that Jesus indeed has already won the victory at the cross 2,000 years ago at Calvary, but he is still waiting patiently to claim it. And it's just like that picture provided to us in the example of Jeremiah, right, who had legally purchased the property. He was now the rightful owner of it before the city fell to Babylon. But it wouldn't be until after the rule of Babylon was complete. It wouldn't be until after the rule of the Gentiles was finally over that Jeremiah would finally be able to take possession of what he had bought. He owned it, right? He purchased it, but there was this period of time that would pass before he could actually take possession. And yet, during that period of time, there was never any doubt at all that that land would eventually be his. And when our kinsman redeemer, Jesus, just like Jeremiah, when he completed 
this transaction, right? When he died on the cross and was buried and when he rose from the dead on the third day, he not only redeemed each one of us from Satan's dominion, but he also redeemed the world. And the writer of the book of Hebrews, of course, is right that even though Jesus has redeemed the creation, we still see this world under the dominion of the devil. We don't yet see it in subjection to God, but we will. Though for right now, probably we're weeping right along with John. Unless we have our, our gaze and our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. Right? The one alone who is worthy. Because look at verse 6. John now sees God's solution to man's problem. It's the slain lamb. In verse 6 it says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So the singular solution right, to all of the problems that we can find rests solely in the slain lamb, Jesus Christ. Remember John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, what did he say? He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And here we see he is the one that is in the midst of everything. Because I, I um, this is just a hunch, but I think probably because of what the elder told John, John was likely looking for a lion, and yet what he saw was a lamb. And it's interesting that the word John uses for lamb is a very specific word that means a little lamb, a delicate lamb. So what John was looking for was not at all what he saw at all. In the very same way that the Jews had been looking for Messiah, they wanted a Messiah that would overthrow Rome and come in and rule like a lion. And it's no different today. So many today are looking for a ruler to come in power and to right all of the wrongs that we see in our society. But we understand that he has already come. And he has righted what is the greatest wrong of all time, and that's the problem of our sin. And he did it through his priceless sacrifice on the cross. Notice this. Notice that John is very specific. He says that the lamb still appeared here as though it had been slain. And that word slain literally means cut in the throat for a sacrifice. And I think that this is so significant because the sacrifice of Jesus is still fresh and current in the eyes of the Father. Still thousands of years later, it is as fresh as it was the day that he died on the cross. And that's the way it needs to be for us too. His sacrifice can never become a common thing to us because it certainly isn't a common thing to the Father. Right? It's that sacrifice that's the proof that he is the perfect acceptable lamb of God, that he's the worthy heir of creation, that he is the one worthy to, and to open these seals. And yet, I think just to go a little further here, I think that there's something more here for us because even beyond what is this important sort of theological understanding about the slain lamb, I think that there's a very personal reckoning with what John saw and with what we are going to one day see. Because from this verse, it certainly appears that the marks of the crucifixion and from the brutality that Jesus suffered as part of his death are still very evident on him even today as he is in heaven in glory. Jesus was arrested and his suffering was 
brutal. And we read the gospel accounts and we see that his you know, scalp was just lacerated from this crown of thorns that was pressed into his head. And his eyes, of course, were blackened and his face was swollen because they kept beating him, right? They plucked his beard right off of his cheeks, the Bible says. And of course, we know that they scourged him basically into a mess of blood and flesh. And then you take all of that torture and you combine it with the crucifixion itself. And it leads the, the, uh, the Bible to say in Isaiah 52 that his appearance was marred more than any other man and his form more than the sons of men. In short, Jesus was disfigured so badly by what happened to him that he was un recognizable as a human being. And yet I think it's so easy for us to get this idea from movies that we've seen, right, or from Sunday school po you know, pictures, that somehow after the resurrection that Jesus was just back to normal and that everything was perfectly fine. And yet even from the scriptures, we know that after the resurrection, Jesus still had the marks of the nails in his hands and feet. We know that he still had that hole in his side. We know that for some reason, those closest to him, including Mary and the disciples, even they didn't recognize who he was. Zechariah writes that when Jesus returns, even at the end of the great tribulation, it says in Zechariah chapter 12 that they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. It says, and someone will say to him, what are these wounds in your hands? And then he will answer, those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And all of this, again, just to point out what we're told in this text, that Jesus still appears in heaven today as this lamb who had been slain as a result of your sins and as a result of my sins. And I think that as we meditate on that thought that we are going to look upon Jesus for all of eternity and that he may indeed bear the scars of our sins on his beautiful face. For me, that kind of puts things into perspective, doesn't it? And how much more should we love him even now this morning? You know, and how much room is there really for us to be holding on to or to be protecting or to be coveting those sins when we see or we even just try to imagine the price that was paid because of it. I remember years ago, do you remember when the Passion of the Christ movie first came out? And there was a group of us from the church that went to see the very first showing on that Friday morning. And I remember specifically at the time I was right in the, in the midst of a very difficult situation with another brother in the church who had really betrayed me and some of the other church leadership in a very bad way. And there was bitterness and there was unforgiveness on both sides. And I will never forget, as I was watching that film, and just watching them try to portray what I have no doubt was much worse than they could ever recreate. I remember just weeping in the theater at the thought that I could be holding on to such petty things. As I realized that it was those very things, right? Those very sins that I refused to let go of, that those were the very things, those were the reason for the suffering that Jesus endured. And I think that as we read this passage and as we consider the reality of this slain lamb, I think that it should bring a sense of fresh perspective to our hearts, but even more so, it should drive us to a place of praise and of thanksgiving. And that's just what we see next.
right? Because there was no created being that was found worthy to take it. Lamb could take it and could open it. And it says in verse 8 that when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. If you ever wondered why we are always pictured sitting around in heaven, kind of happily strumming our harps, well, here it is. This is it. But notice next, not only are we going to be strumming, but we are going to be singing as well. Because it says in verse 9 that they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So when the lamb finally takes the scroll, there is this immediate response. You see these wonderful high-ranking angels, right? These fantastic four creatures these and redeemed man all joining together now worshiping the Lamb. And we are going to sing his praises and we are going to magnify his death because of our redemption. This is heaven singing about the cross. And it's a song that we're the only ones, aren't we, that can sing it. Because in a way, the lyrics are such a fantastic summary of not only God's design, but his destiny for us as his followers, right? Saved out of every different kind of situation and saved into this wonderful life of service and this life of purpose to someday rule with him, but even now, to represent him, right? It says to be priests for him, right? Declaring his grace and his goodness. Right now, we get to spend the rest of our lives living not just for temporal things, but we get to live for things that are eternal. We now get to wake up each and every day knowing that we have this precious privilege of introducing others to our Savior and our Redeemer. And remember in chapter 4, remember the living creatures and then these very same elders. Remember at that point, we were praising Jesus because he's the creator of all things. But now here, we join now and praise him because he's the redeemer of all things. Right? He purchased the world 2,000 years ago, but this is it. In this act here, in chapter 5, as he rises up and he takes that scroll, he will now finally take possession of what he purchased 2,000 years ago on the cross. And what happens right here in chapter 5, and then what we are going to see throughout the whole rest of the book of Revelation, it is like the greatest close of escrow in all of human history. Here Jesus is finally going to take possession of all that is rightfully his because he is worthy because of Calvary, because of that redemptive work and his sinless sacrifice. And we will praise him for it. It says there with a new song, right? A special song right, that our lives should be singing even now. And our lives should prompt others to sing it as well. Because look what happens next. Not only is the church praising the Lamb, but now we're going to see that all of heaven itself is praising the Lamb. It says in verse 11, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So first it was the elders, then it was the living creatures were singing their song of praise. Now the multitudes of these angels in heaven are all joining in in praise to the Lamb. 
declaring that he's worthy because of this redemption that he's accomplished. By the way, for those of you who are math challenged like I am, 10,000 times 10,000, that is 100 million. And then to that, it says that we add thousands and thousands. And of course, the idea here is simply everybody. Everybody is praising Jesus because of his work on the cross, even the angels, which is super interesting, right? The angels couldn't possibly sing the song that we sang back in verses 9 and 10, the song of the redeemed, because nowhere in the Bible does it tell us, does it talk about the redemption of the angels. Only mankind can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And yet here, this voice of this innumerable amount of angels rises up with all of us to praise the Redeemer. And what's interesting is that the angels may not have been personally or directly impacted by the work of Jesus on the cross, but they can so clearly see the greatness of the work of God in the redemption of fallen men because there is nothing else which more clearly exemplifies his amazing grace. And you remember that Peter in his first letter to the church, he talks about the fact that our salvation, he says, is something that the angels desire to look into. It is something that the angels want to understand. It is something that probably makes no sense to them why God would act so graciously towards us, why Jesus would die for us when we are so very undeserving, and yet he did it because of his love for us. He did it because of this great grace towards us. And so in response, all that heaven can possibly do is to credit him for that, for power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, all of it to the Lamb, because heaven understands what earth doesn't. We think about the contrast between the praise that's being ascribed to Jesus here by all of heaven and then the accounts of the way he was treated during his life on earth. Remember, the enemies of Jesus said he was worthy of death, but heaven says he's worthy of praise. Men accuse Jesus of working according to the power of Satan, but here heaven says that he's worthy of all the power of heaven. Second Corinthians chapter 8 says he became poor for our sake, and yet here heaven declares that he's deserving of all riches. We know that on earth he was crucified in weakness, but here he's being praised for his power. He was completely dishonored on earth, but he's honored in glory. He was made a curse on the cross, but today he's the redeemer and he's the giver of all blessing. It's like Paul wrote to the Corinthians when he says that the message of the cross is, cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And we see here that the message of the cross is wisdom, it says, to all the angels in heaven. And you may have heard me say this before, but remember that God's economy is not our economy. Right? Isaiah chapter 55 is one of my favorite chapters, one of my favorite scriptures, verses eight and nine, where the Lord says that my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I bring this up today because I think that looking at the current reality of Jesus enthroned there in heaven, and then when we compare it to the past reality of his life on earth, that should bring amazing comfort to us during the most difficult times in our lives. Those times when it seems like there couldn't possibly be a good outcome, we can trust that God is working for good. 
right? He gives us understanding that God so often works in our lives and the way he strengthens and, and refines us. It may not seem right to the way that we understand it, but his methods always bring about our good. It's usually the deepest blessing in our lives that comes from the deepest brokenness. It's the deepest experience of peace that comes during that time of the most terrible storm. And it's the deepest sense of fulfillment in our lives that only comes as we learn, like Jesus did, to serve others the way that he served us. We don't always understand God's ways, but we can always understand his nature. We can rest in his faithfulness. We can rest in his promises to us and his plans for us, just like Jeremiah did right, when he bought that worthless piece of land. And just like Jesus did the way that he had to when he came here to purchase us. Jesus had to trust in the goodwill of the Father. Paul said to the Philippians that Jesus being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so we see exactly that. Now as we finish up in our text today, we see finally that this praise of the slain lamb just continues to grow and to grow and to grow some more. Verses 13 and 14 says that every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Once again, John couldn't be more complete in his description. Truly, every living creature, right? First the elders, then the four living creatures, then the multitudes of angels in heaven, now all creation, right? Everything everywhere, all joining in worship for all eternity of the Lamb, Jesus. And so we have this sense of just how this kind of incredible circle of praise is growing and growing. And I think this speaks to us. I think it should be an encouragement to us that it's as we commit ourselves to the worship and the praise of Jesus simply by the way that we live our lives, right? As witnesses of his grace and evidences of his goodness and examples of his love, it's then that we too start to affect those around us and then we affect those around them and then they affect those around them until finally everybody who's in our own little circle or by God's grace, our city and our county and our country, until everyone is finally praising Jesus for who he is and what he's done. That Greek word there for worship in verse 14 literally means to prostrate oneself, right? to lay before another in complete submission. And I think we can picture these elders, remember, who represent us, Maybe they first fall down to their knees, but then that's not enough, and they go a step further, and they just fully lay themselves out on the floor of heaven in full worship and full adoration and full surrender to him who lives forever and ever. It's its expression of our total submission and our total worship. And I think that what I want us to remember today is that true worship really begins when we see that slain lamb. 
It really begins for us when we look upon his face. And those who truly worship today, they're not the people that are singing the loudest or the best or who are raising their hands the highest or, you know, closing their eyes the tightest. But it's those who understand to the fullest that Jesus Christ died for them. That he who knew no sin, sin became sin for us as we really start to see the slain lamb, as we see those scars that he still bears because of our sin, we can't help but fall down. As we see those scars that he still bears because of our sin, we can't help but fall down flat on our face. Paul tells the Corinthians our lives are not our own, that we were bought with a price, and that price was the life of Jesus. And so we simply now offer our lives back to him and we allow him to transform us into his image and live his life through ours. And so this scene in chapter five, folks, this is where we're headed because of him. And we're headed there specifically because of that bloody brow, because of that crown of thorns and because of the scourging that he took and because of the spit that was all over him and because of the blasphemies, because of that spear that was shoved into his side, because of that separation that he endured from the Father as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of what he did, he did because he wants this to be the scene that every human being finds themselves in. And if you still sit here this morning, or if you still are watching this morning and you are not saved, if you've never trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of, our, of your sins, you need to trust in him this morning. The Bible says that God is not wanting for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He wants this to be your future too. And he has paid an enormous price for that to be possible and he did it all because he loves you because he loves me because he loves all of us I don't get why right and yet he does right this is our future and it's our future because of our savior amen so father we thank you so much lord we thank you for this precious future lord that your son Jesus purchased and provided for us, Father. And we thank you for this description that John gives us of what we can expect to see, Lord, as we're there in heaven, in your glory. And so, Father, this morning we pray that you would help the, the sacrifice of Jesus to be more real to us this morning, perhaps, than it ever has been, Lord. By that work of your spirit, help Help that sacrifice to be fresh and to be real and to be current for us, Lord, and to drive us to that place of praise and of thanksgiving, Lord, and of just being fully laid out before you, Lord, offering our lives up in worship to you. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord. We do it in Jesus' name. Amen.